For the past few days, I've been hearing this intermittent buzzing sound. At first, I thought I'd become used to it and stop hearing it entirely, but to me, it just became more obnoxious over time. It transformed into something akin to a constant vibrating noise in the back of my head. It was difficult to focus on anything. It became so bad that I had trouble sleeping, and it's beyond me how my parents never noticed it. You know what they say, though. You lose your hearing with age. So I wasn't surprised when they gave me confused looks. Tyler, my neighbor, heard it though, and I was relieved at that. It meant I wasn't going crazy. He's actually the one that brought it up when we were in my bedroom playing video games. With him at my side, I became determined to find the source of the noise. We searched my house first and placed our ears all over the walls, and the buzzing sound never seemed to become weaker or stronger, so we went outside. My original thought was that someone... My original thought was that something was wrong with our air conditioning unit. If I was right, it would explain why the sound transferred throughout the entire house. Needless to say, my theory was wrong. We sit outside the thrumming unit, watching the gigantic fan spin around inside. The unit was vibrating, but it wasn't the sound we were looking for. However, we realized the sound was louder outside than it had been in my room. Searching my backyard up and down, we came to a stop at the wooden fence surrounding my yard. We paced our ears to it and exchanged a knowing stare. The sound was coming from beyond the fence. And that was enough for both of us. We climbed it and dropped easily to the other side. The area beyond my backyard was filled with untouched forest. I'd been over my fence a few times when I'd accidentally kicked a soccer ball over, but not often enough to really explore. My parents always complained about there being poison ivy everywhere, and there was. We skirted around it and created a path without a problem. It was really bizarre, though. All we could hear was this buzzing sound, nothing else. I mean, we could just barely hear the leaves and sticks crackling beneath our feet, but all other sounds seemed absent. There were no birds chirping, which was the weirdest part for me. You'd be hard-pressed to find an area of the woods where there aren't birds constantly singing to each other. As we kept walking, the buzzing sound grew louder, and eventually we couldn't see my fence anymore. We stopped several yards from a cluster of trees covered in tumor-like growths. We just stood there, staring at it, and neither of us could explain what they were. They appeared like they were a part of the trees, as if the bark had bubbled outward in these strange formations. Trees can't actually develop deformed growths called burls, something I learned in hindsight. Naturally, though, our first thought were to poke at it, but both of us were too chicken to get any closer so we grabbed rocks instead. It only took one toss. Tyler was a baseball player. The rock collided with one of the large growths, and upon contact, the growth exploded outward, sending chunks flying. Not even seconds later, bees, thousands of bees, swarmed out of the opening and formed into a thick, throbbing mass. Both of us screamed and ran. I'd never run faster in my entire life. The bees were hot on our heels, and I could feel their stingers plunging into my arms, my back, my legs, anywhere they could swarm. I don't remember hopping the fence or how I arrived in my front yard, but it must have been screaming bloody murder. I stripped down to my underwear, and my mom began spraying me and the persistent bees with the garden hose. The icy, pressurized water didn't hurt as bad as the stings or the welts that formed instantly. I was ushered into the kitchen, given a towel, and my mom began meticulously removing the stingers with a pair of tweezers. She lost count of how many she removed from my body. I was only allowed to change into dry underwear since the stings needed to be iced. The swelling and welts had been unimaginable, and now I understand how people can die from bee stings. I was forced onto the couch with ice packs positioned all over my body. The majority of the stings were on my back, so I laid on my stomach and must have passed out some time later. I woke the next day in the same position. The ice packs had been removed. My mom refused to let me change into something comfortable until she inspected all of the welts. 
Thankfully, the swelling had reduced significantly since the previous day. Over a bowl of soup, I learned that my parents called an exterminator after the incident. Apparently, there had been bees angrily flying around our yard and some of the neighbors' yard. By that point, everyone on our street could hear the enraged buzzing. The exterminator arrived promptly and followed the trail of chaotic bees back to the nest. The man actually told my parents that it had been the largest colony he'd ever seen. He sprayed so many chemicals that he didn't want anyone near the area. Not that anyone wanted to go investigate for themselves. The whole situation made me feel like a complete idiot. How could we have been so stupid? My only consolation was that Tyler might have suffered just as bad as me with the bee stings. I brought this up to my parents and asked how bad his injuries were. My mother gave me this petrified expression that I'll never forget. There had been nobody behind me when I raced around the side of my house. She hadn't even been aware that Tyler had gone back there with me. I felt guilty. Beyond guilty. For the next few days, horrible images of Tyler being swarmed consumed me. I swore that he'd been right beside me. What made me feel worse is that the exterminator never saw anyone. If Tyler had fallen and been injured, the exterminator would have known because he had to search the entire area for nests and make sure everything was sprayed with pesticides. About a week after the incident, Tyler was still missing. I decided to go search the area for myself, but I wasn't going to go unprepared. I grabbed a can of my mother's hairspray along with the lighter from the kitchen. If any of these bees were still kicking, then I wanted protection. I hopped the fence and moved slowly through the forest, my right hand clenched tightly on the hairspray. The distance to the nest was much further than I remembered. I knew that I'd arrived when I heard a thick crunch beneath my shoes. I glanced down and felt a shiver rush through my body. The entire ground was layered with bee corpses. I couldn't see the dirt or grass, and in some areas the bees just piled on top of each other. I was on my last nerve when I approached the nests, trying my best to ignore the sickening crunches underfoot. I narrowed my eyes at the nests that we destroyed, and when I rounded the tree, the rest of the nests became apparent, nearly ten times larger. I cautiously nudged one of the nests, which crumbled and revealed thick wax and honeycomb. Dead bees trapped inside one of the nests oozed through the opening, and it was enough to turn my stomach. I grumbled beneath my breath and began poking the nest with more confidence, watching more of the pieces fall to the ground. That's when I heard the buzzing return. My heart skipped several beats, and I nearly stumbled backward and landed in the disgusting ruin of dead bees. I sprinted back several feet and raised the hairspray and lighter, watching the nest from all angles. These bees could appear from anywhere. They must have formed their nests throughout this cluster of trees, and it was very possible that their nests extended into the ground as well and beneath the roots. I bit my lip and waited for the swarm to appear like last time, but they never did. Instead... An odd and disturbing sight took me by surprise, enough for me to lower my guard. I left the clearing filled with dead bees and stepped through several bushes trying to confirm what I was seeing. My whole body quivered and I wanted to call out. My voice failed me though and it might have saved my life. Not even ten yards from me was Tyler. He was just standing there, his back facing me, and something was wrong. His movements were off. His body was twitching involuntarily, and when he took a step, his posture was rigid while his arms were locked in janky positions. Despite the horrible feeling in my gut, I wanted to call out to him. My concern quickly transformed into fear. Tyler returned and lolled his head to the side as if his neck were broken. He knew I was here, yet he couldn't see me. His eyes were gone, 
two dark sockets, stared back at me with bees crawling out of them. Sores layered his flesh, which had turned into gaping holes, and viscous fluid was running down his chin. I was too scared to move. I only ran when Tyler began lumbering toward me, swaying back and forth and twitching. For the second time, I screamed and ran for the hills, trying to outrun the crashes coming from behind me. When I scrambled over the fence, I felt the wood scraping my skin, but I didn't care. I pounded on my back door crazily and slammed it shut once my mother let me inside. She didn't understand much of what I was saying since I was hysterical, but she gathered that I'd found Tyler's body in the woods. By the time the police arrived, they waited for me to calm down so I could explain what I saw. It was a mess, and they must have thought that I was nuts. They searched the area where I saw Tyler, but they didn't find him. They found his body, yards upon yards, farther away by a creek. Tyler had been reclined on his knees with his forehead against the ground, immobile and dead. I refused to ID him. I couldn't see those empty eye sockets again. When I recovered from the event, I wanted to know what happened. I emailed a pathologist, the one who performed Tyler's autopsy, and practically begged for answers. I needed a logical explanation for what I saw. He explained how they were going through a routine procedure when they hit a major roadblock. When they sliced Tyler open, dead bees poured out, his body literally bloated with bees. His eyes were missing, his jaw was broken, completely unhinged. His teeth were gone along with his tongue, which was replaced with wax. The worst part was this. His organs were gone. All that was left was the skeleton, muscles, and tissues, which seemed to be the base for the extreme amount of honeycomb within his chest cavity. The pathologist's only theory was that the bees devoured his organs, but bees aren't carnivores. There's only one way... I can explain this. There's a scientific concept called microevolution, and it's defined as evolutionary change with a species or small group of organisms, especially over a short period. It must have been triggered by the pesticides. It must have. The following is a series of the most recent excerpts from a private journal of Harry Relic, a 22-year-old found dead in his apartment this evening. The apparent death, overdose by cyanide. I wake up at 10 in the morning to my phone ringing. I pick up, expecting Hannah to be on the other end, but instead I hear her sister, Mary. She is in hysterics. I ask her what the problem is, trying to calm her down. She tells me that Hannah is dead. The impact, the sound of those words has on me. As I hear her scream down the phone, I tell her that I cannot put into words how devastated I am, how upset I am. She hangs up without a goodbye. I lie in bed. Paralyzed. She's gone. She's actually gone. I don't even cry. I deal with things in my own way, I guess. Always have. As I replay those words in my head again and again, sitting up, I try to imagine Hannah in a coffin and only 20 years old. So young, so pretty. I only saw Hannah the other day. It was her birthday. I gave her that bottle of vodka, and when I got invited to a small get-together, she had at her house with some friends. We sat by a bonfire. She played the guitar and sung. She had such a lovely voice. I'm having difficulty sleeping tonight. I keep remembering that Hannah is dead. I keep seeing her face, her eyes, her smile. Maybe I should put the journal down and try to sleep again. I really hope no one reads this but me. 
days have passed. I have nothing to write in here. I'm going to Hannah's funeral tomorrow. Hopefully then I can find some sanity once I know for certain that she's dead. I keep questioning it. I know she is, but I just can't believe that she's gone. I stand over Hannah's coffin at the funeral, staring down at her in the rain, still completely spellbound. They say that she killed herself. Mary said she found her the following morning. The morning, postman arriving a few minutes after discovering them both. Apparently, she was visiting early to make her some breakfast in the hope to cheer Hannah up. What a thing to start the day with. I talk to friends and relations and tell them how shocked I am that she killed herself. How much I'm grieving her. I walk around the church. And there's so many people there. Some I recognize, some I don't. And it must have had a lot of people that cared about her. So many names, so many faces I recognize as venture around. Mary, Joe, Brooke, Marcus. It's surprising how many I actually know that were close to Hannah. However, I turn to the back of the room and I see a tall figure standing there. A figure that I've not seen before. He's wearing a hood that conceals his face. He keeps very quiet. No one acknowledges his existence but me. He doesn't move. Do I know him? I ignore the ghostly figure. I do my best to keep other spirits up. We exchange memories of Hannah. The service is nice. I think Hannah would have liked it. If I don't want to focus on the past, I should put the journal down, but I need to make a final note, Anna. I walk through the streets where you walked. I visit cafes, expecting to catch a glimpse of you. It's so strange not seeing your face around. You were weak and gentle, but I never thought you would turn to suicide. I wish I'd meant more to you. I wish I could have been there as you died to tell you how I really felt about you if... Only I was there to save you, Anna Montague. I think that'll do. After the funeral, I decided to invite Joe Caves out for a drink, an old friend who was also at the funeral. Though Joe is quite introverted and reserved, he makes great for table conversation and is very faithful. He even supposedly gave a spare house key for his postman to use if the package was too big. That always used to make me laugh. Me and Joe went to the same secondary school and stayed friends even after I changed to college rather than staying on sixth form like him. Joe didn't know Hannah as well as me, but maybe that helps. Bar's mostly empty beside a few folk. I hand him a martini for his drink, smiling as I do, buying myself a bottle of wine. As we begin to catch up, I smile. I talk to him about my recent script writing. Joe says he has a job as a journalist for a local newspaper. Our mutual love for writing always kept us close. I smile, telling him that I'm happy for him and I hope he could turn into a very prosperous career, as long as he doesn't make more money than me. I tease. I always say that I myself am keeping a journal. He tells me it's good for keeping notes and ideas if you don't obsess over it. As the night goes on, we share a few laughs. As the conversation becomes more personal, he asks me if I still live alone, I say yes. He tells me having a flatmate, especially one obsessed with detective stories, is a pain, but recently the house has felt emptier and it's been quite relieving. Joe's had the same flatmate for a few months now, as I recall, and I don't really know him well. When it gets late, we leave the pub. Outside, we say goodbye, splitting directions. I tell him to call me in the morning. However, I wonder if he is in condition to walk back safely. Should I have walked him home? I think his flatmate is in anyway, so never mind. As I begin to walk, I at first feel relatively comfortable, but when I turn my head to watch Joe disappear in the night, I get this sense of paranoia, as though I'm being watched.
the streets become quieter and quieter as the time passes. I look around, and though I know no one is there, I feel uneasy. I felt fine at the bar. Is it the alcohol? I stop and stare into the empty road. I'm not delusional or anything, but the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I swear that I'm being watched. Is anyone there? I question myself. I think for a second I see a foot in the shadows, maybe someone keeping their gaze on me. I don't like the sound of this. Why are they here? No, <laughs> I'm overthinking. I should get home and sleep. It's the next morning. It's early, and I'm playing Texas Hold'em with my brother, Brooke, who's 19, who paid me an early visit. My phone rings, but the number's withheld. I don't normally pick up withheld numbers, but feeling wary because of the night before, I make an exception. Is it Joe? I answer, and it doesn't sound like Joe. More like Joe's flatmate, only with a stammer in his voice and apparent sobbing. He tells me that Joe is dead. I look over at my brother, who can also hear the other end of the line, now staring at me in shock. My hands shaking, I simply hang up, dropping the phone. I'm not sure if I believe the caller. My brother tries to comfort me. I explain to him that after we left the pub, I didn't see what happened to him, and I wasn't sure if he was being followed. I also mentioned that I felt as though I myself was being followed by someone that night. When he leaves my apartment, I then tell him I'm now suspicious that Hannah's suicide wasn't a suicide at all. I know she had no reason, no good reason, to kill herself. I tell him I'm scared that someone could possibly have killed Hannah and Joe. He tries to tell me that I'm just paranoid, but... I insist that there was someone out there staring at me and that could be responsible for Joe's death. Brooks always blamed me for having too much of an imagination. I think he's accused me of being schizophrenic in the past, too. I'm not, believe me. I checked. He can't use that against me. My brother persuades me to stop overthinking things and tells me he'll visit again if I need him. He leaves me to be alone with my thoughts. I'm on my own again. This has reached an entirely new level. I can't stop thinking about Joe. God, he's the second one. Are, are there going to be others? Other murders? The very thought gives me goosebumps. These were murders, despite my brother insisting it's just me being paranoid. Moreover, was I being watched that night? If I was, they're responsible for this dreadful feeling I have in my stomach. To be honest, I'm scared of what they'll do next. It's been two days, and I've been walking a lot getting home at unreasonable times. I can't stop thinking about that phone call. Upon finding the body, Joe's flatmate must have taken Joe's phone and called the last person that called him, me. But why? Did he even call an ambulance before he phoned me? I'm worried I'm not thinking straight. I try and relax. Joe's flatmate probably just felt the need to tell someone that was close to him, someone he knew. I've seen him a couple of times, but I don't think I've ever spoken to him properly, though. Why did he call me? I can't sleep. I've found myself ringing Joe and letting it go to voicemail before I remember that he's dead. It's difficult to put into words what that realization is like. At Joe's funeral, I stand over his coffin, this time with a sickly feeling in my stomach, unlike the one before. I don't really know anyone at this funeral. Mary's here, though. She keeps me at ease. As I walk away, I catch a glimpse of that tall figure in black, one I've seen once before next to the coffin, but he disappears. My brother tells me I'm just being paranoid, that accidents happen and people commit suicide. 
I don't think it's ever as simple as that, no matter how over-imaginative he thinks I am. This has been such a surreal day. I'm much less talkative at this funeral than Hannah's. I'm still getting that horrible feeling like I'm being watched. Why won't he go away? It always seems to rain in England. For fuck's sake, why am I writing this down? I'm getting my journal wet. I'm trying to remember what Joe's flatmate looked like, though. I think he had a weird face, a nose that looked broken. Obviously a nose I can't remember. I think his name began with an M. Macy? Mike? I just can't get him out of my head. After Joe's funeral, I decided to meet up with Mary with coffee. However, I nearly cancelled it and saved it for another day. I've been so paranoid recently. I go up to the counter and buy two coffees. She chooses a window seat. I sit down and hand her her coffee. But as I do so, I see a familiar figure in the window. On the other side of the street, people walking around him, I feel him stare at me. There and then, I know he's waiting for the next victim to drop dead. No, I need to stop. I... <sighs> I try to ignore the figure, but it won't go away. He just stands there in the rain as though even it completely avoids him. Mary snaps me out of my trance and I turn back to her. She tells me she's sorry for Joe's loss, and at first I believe she's going to spew out the same naive bullshit that Brooke did, but then she says that she too is paranoid about what's going on. She tells me that she doesn't believe Hannah killed herself, but instead that someone murdered her and made it look like a suicide. I tell her I've been thinking the exact same thing. As she finishes her coffee, I turn back to the window. Figure's nowhere to be seen. I stare at the street, wondering where he went. And then I stare at Mary, trying to avoid being hysterical. I try to calm down. Mary tells me that she'll do anything to avenge Hannah. It's her own way of dealing with it, I guess. I smile knowing that Mary hasn't changed one bit. As we leave, I tell her to have a safe journey and not to run into any strangers, but that she could be in danger. She says that she won't. It's been a few hours, and it's getting dark. I walk home, and I can't stop thinking about Joe's flatmate. I think his height was also what made him look so significant, but I'm not sure. It's difficult to remember someone you haven't seen in months. Walking up the stairs to the floor of my flat, at the foot of my door collapsed on the ground, a hand stretched out. It's Mary. I grab my phone from my pocket and dial the emergency services, already knowing that it's useless. My mind races. Who else was at the cafe? Was someone in there spying on me? Did anyone notice? I try to get the image of the figure on the street out of my head, but in a craze, I look down the hallway and for a split second, I see that very tall, faceless, hooded figure again, but within a second, he's gone. My eyes widen. My paranoia heightens as the emergency services answer. I tell them my location and that someone is dying, but I already know the truth. He has already claimed her. She's already dead. A third... My fucking god, a third. I pick up her phone that she dropped while waiting for the rescue service and notice a half-written text that she didn't get to send. It's addressed to me. Harry, I'm coming to yours. I think you're right about me being in danger. When we left the cafe, however, I bumped into your friend. I think his name was Mark. He says he eavesdropped our conversation and that I'm not safe. I think this is about you, Harry. I think you're in the center of all this. It's like someone is killing off the ones you care about and making them look like accidents. I'll avenge her, I swear. I'll explain when I get to yours, but I... It must have been where she fell unconscious. I don't know who this Mark is, but he clearly got to her and pretended to be my friend. Who the fuck is he? No, I know who murdered her. Who is this Mark, and why is he doing this to me? 
I racked my brains trying to remember. No, it couldn't be. The paramedics race up the stairs, but I cannot move as I make the connection in my head. It's so obvious. Why didn't I realize it before? He clearly got to her and pretended to be my friend. He was the last person Mary was with. He was the last person Joe was with, too. My fear turns to anger as the paramedics rush Mary's fragile corpse away. Over Mary's coffin, I stand in fear of the enemy taking me. Going to my friend's funeral is like routine by now. Some fucking routine. I say a few words, trying to keep my act together to acquaintances and relations. Needless to say, I'm more concerned with my own well-being at the moment. Is that bad? Am I a bad person for thinking that? My friends are being picked off one by one until there's only me left. Only me. Like it's a game. But am I going to come out of this alive? Only time will tell. I wander through the service, craving answers. About to give up, I turn to the exit. I notice someone's face. A face I recognize, someone I've been looking for. Marcus. At last I found you, Marcus. You're Joe's flatmate. You were watching me and Mary at the cafe. You must have been at Hannah's get-together all those weeks ago. You with the broken-looking nose, the hood, the deformed height. I've seen you so many times before, but just haven't recognized you. Of course it's you. Who else would it be? I'm instantly filled with rage. He was the so-called Mark Mary specified in her desperate last text. I got to Mary first, but he clearly got to her last. Marcus Bates. I think his last name was Bates. Did she merely mishear his name being Mark, or was it an alias? Questions filled my head. He pretended him and I were friends just before she died. I know the truth, though. We're not friends at all. The way he lies, that fucking phone call when Joe died, it's so obvious why he rang me first. He already knows everything. He just wants to taunt me. I'm glad no one reads my journal. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he acts like a psychopath. He thinks like a murderer. He keeps looking at me. He knows, but does he know that I know? I'm on to him, but is he on to that? I put on a friendly act. I smile at him and ask him how he knew Mary. He stammers, saying that they were old friends. What a liar he is. I tell him I know Joe as well. He smiles, saying that he made a good flatmate. Well, of course you're going to be truthful about that. You're the one who rang me. Joe told me about you. You'd blow your cover if you told me anything different. I need to find out more about him without looking suspicious. Stop him while I can. I invite him out to a drink at my place, saying I would love company and I would like to get to know him better. He accepts my invitation. Of course he does. But I'm not playing into his hands. I'm not becoming his victim. I'm on to him. When the funeral ends, we walk to my apartment together. I watch his every move as he walks there. It's only the early evening, though. I doubt he'll try something this soon. The next pieces of writing aren't very neat. I apologize for that. Marcus enters my apartment after me. As I hear the door close behind me, I tell him all I have is beer, but he says beer is fine, as long as he gets to pour the drinks. I don't trust him, but I let him anyway. We ask each other how we knew Joe, little bits about ourselves, how we're coping with his death. I say that I miss him terribly. Such... Pointless small talk. We both know why he's here. I put a knife in my back pocket, though I've never used a weapon before. I pretend to finish my beer and fake needing to pee. So as I go to the bathroom, I haven't drunk a sip. I know what the drink's been spiked with. 
I pour the content of the glass down the toilet as so not to sound suspicious, flush the toilet for good measure. I walk back into the living room and see him right outside my front door, closing it. I ask him why he left. He said he needed to use the toilet as well, so he went and found a public one. I struggle to believe that, but he insists that he was desperate. I don't know what he's up to, but I stare at his stupid face. Are you really capable of killing someone, Marcus? This is getting childish. As I sit down, I watch him finish his beer. We stare at each other. He then grins and finally words of truth come out. Marcus tells me how glad he is to have finally cornered me, how glad he is that I cannot escape. He clenches his fist, dropping the glass of beer. I don't get up from my seat. I'm glued to it, terrified. I have no idea what he is about to do. Is he going to hurt me? I hold back panic. He reaches into his pocket. What's in there? Is that a knife? A gun? Are you seriously going to try and hurt me? Or are you capable of killing another human being? Then I see that familiar shadow behind me. My heart sinks. Marcus looks up and suddenly stops. He leans forward and begins to choke. He grabs onto his neck, ripping his red hoodie. He starts to lose balance, shaking and coughing and sputtering as I just stare at him. Within one minute, Marcus is nothing more than a corpse on my living room floor. He isn't the murderer. He never was. I jump up, my eyes fixated on Marcus Bates' body. I begin to bring up my phone when I hit a realization. Something I knew the whole time but just forgot, like it was at the back of my mind. I drop my own glass of empty beer. Joe doesn't have a flatmate. My eyes widen as I hold back a scream. I desperately try and scramble onto some truth, some reality. No, Marcus Bates was Joe Cave's flatmate, but as my memories come back, I realize that he hasn't been for a couple of months. He left. I flick through my journal, rereading of previous things that I've written. He tells me having a flatmate is a pain, but recently the house has felt emptier and it's been quite relieving. I'm so stupid. Marcus even said that Joe did make a good flatmate. I frantically try and rethink everything, but the truth is inevitable and so bloody obvious. Joe has lived on his own for two months. But in that case, the morning Joe's body was found, who rang me that morning? Am I going insane? In complete shock, I look down at Marcus's hand, buried in his pocket, so I frantically pull it out. Wrapped inside his fingers, there's no knife or gun, but a phone, with a text message sent less than a minute ago. He must have sent it while behind his back. The text says to an unknown number, I'm at Harry's. He's safe for now. Call the police. The light goes out. I lift my knife. Shit, Marcus probably did need the toilet. It wasn't an elaborate ploy. He left the door open, though. He must have. Did, did anyone sneak in? I now completely understand. Turning to the figure rising up in the darkness, one whose stare I felt on me three times already. I edge back my knife in the air. He's been here the whole time with Marcus and I, just waiting to claim another. He stands over Marcus's body as I edge all the way back to the wall before the figure disappears again. Am I alone with my fate? Is this part of the plan? I've never been more afraid in my entire life. I slash my knife into the darkness as I hear distant sirens get louder. I try hard to think, looking for a way out, but I can't avoid it. Every single time. The victim's death has occurred closer to me. Firstly, no immediate connection. Second, as soon as I leave his company. Third, outside my apartment. And fourth, in front of my very eyes. I don't think I've seen someone die before. I'm terrified the figure will appear again. One whose face I still have never seen.
Police are going to arrive soon. I calm down, accepting my fate. I don't think the figure is going to just leave, though. I think he's sticking around. Am I the next to die? The police will come and find me here, dead, along with Marcus. In the darkness, the figure waits. I know it. In the gloom, too scared to turn the light back on, I've decided to simply scribble this all in my journal as my last memoirs. I hear the distant sirens get louder and louder. I'm having difficulty keeping calm as I write these words, but even if I haven't been killed by the time they arrive, I don't know what I'll do. I have the same feeling as I did that night with Joe and that evening with Mary, except so much worse. Like it's closer. Like it's breathing down my neck, staring at the back of my head, staring into my soul. And the worst part is, I'll either end up dead or in the police custody. The more I fill this journal in, the more I realize that these words are probably the last I'll ever write. I feel the end coming near. I accept my fate now. This is part of the plan. I'm just going to keep writing now. Just keep writing. I'm going to just forget about the possibility of dying. I'm going to get killed by the same monster that killed Hannah Montague, Joe Caves, Mary Montague, and since ten minutes ago, Marcus Bates. The killer is a monster, no doubt about it. I scream at the figure now in sight again, telling him to perish, but he doesn't. He can't. I pour myself a drink, my last drink, like Hannah's last vodka, or Joe's last martini, Mary's last coffee, or Marcus's last beer. To conclude my pathetic, unfortunate journal that I promised myself I wouldn't obsess over, anyone reads this that is none the wiser would probably believe that I'm fucking crazy, that I imagined people up, that I've lost touch with reality. I know the truth, though. The figure comes back into the light. He stands above me, so tall, his shadow covers me. I don't see his face. I don't know what he looks like, but I know him well enough. He took Mary Montague, Joe Caves, Mary Montague, and Marcus Bates. Well, he would do, wouldn't he? He takes everyone in the end. He's death. I only imagined him. I'm not delusional. I didn't believe for a second that he existed. I needed to feel normal. I needed to deal with the murders that popped up around me. Maybe it was death all around me that turned me into a quivering wreck. Maybe. But everyone deals with things in their own way, don't they? People see ghosts to deal with their grief. People see angels to deal with their faith. I'm not different. I saw death for how he truly is. Every time I stood over their grave, I saw death. Every time I knew in the back of my mind that they would die, I saw death despite how much I hated to. I've always dealt with death in an extreme way, but if you still think I'm fucking crazy, if you still believe that I'm schizophrenic like Brooke does, if you still aren't convinced that I know the truth, know this. I had no reason, no reason whatsoever to kill those four innocent human beings. But I did it anyway.